Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we were in Acts chapter 1. We'll continue from the same passage. All right. So uh, we said that in this passage, we have uh, the ascension of the Lord Jesus um, being spoken of by Luke. He makes it very clear that uh, you know, Jesus is now ascended up into heaven. He talks a little bit about the ministry uh, of uh, Jesus. He talks about the uh, Trinity. He talks about the empowering work of the Holy Spirit, even in the life of Jesus. Why is it so? Uh, simply because the Lord Jesus, um, uh, you know, was fully man. And we know that, right? Uh, we know that he also needed the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in order to move in signs, wonders, and miracles. That's a very encouraging thought because we all have the same Holy Spirit in our lives to uh, help us. We see how Jesus spent 40 days uh, continuing to do his wondrous works among people as uh, First Corinthians chapter 15 uh, reminds us there were uh, at least 500 people, many people, which is you know about 500 people who who witnessed him and uh, who saw this resurrected Jesus. So it's a historical uh, event. 40 days, 40 days after when uh, we know that uh, you know the Lord Jesus when he was taken into trial and he died. It was the Passover. And uh, many rituals of the Passover, the activities of the Passover are talked about during the death of Jesus Christ. So 40 days after the Passover, uh, Jesus was around with the people. And we saw how the focus of God doesn't change. The message doesn't change. So even when Jesus was resurrected and ministering to the same disciples, he stuck to the message pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that is a reminder for us. We must not move away from the the core theme uh, of the gospel. We must not move away from the Lord Jesus being our, um, uh, you know, central message. Uh, we should not move away from uh, preaching about the demonstration of the gospel and, you know, all the essentials that so far have become the foundation uh, of what we believe. We must continue to speak the same things. And that's what Jesus said. He talked about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now let's move ahead to verse 4 here. And uh, we see uh, how these disciples were you know, uh, during the resurrection of Jesus and, uh, you know, uh, meaning at the time when Jesus was with them before the ascension. So in verse 4, it says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Okay. So what's happening now? Jesus is not yet ascended. He's going to ascend. And uh, Luke is saying that Jesus was with the resurrected Christ, was with the disciples. He gave them a command. What was the command? He said, don't go from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. Now Jesus is also talking about something else that is important. When we are uh, going away on a, a long vacation or a long break or, 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 or some assignment where we are going to uh, leave behind you know, our, uh, uh, the people that we work with or, or the people at home. What do we do? We give them the, the most important instructions, right? So first he spoke about the kingdom of God and now he's talking about the Holy Spirit because he knows that the Holy Spirit is so important for each believer. So he's commanding them. He tells them, look, something special is going to happen in Jerusalem and I don't want you to miss it. So he says, wait. Wait means what? Wait until, wait till you receive, wait till it comes to pass. Okay. So you need to receive it. You can't miss it. And that, that's the point here when he says, you wait in Jerusalem 
until you receive what is in store for you and he's referring to um, this this um, uh, upcoming you know uh, event or what the the people are going to receive as the promise of the father so what is the promise of the father the promise of the father is the baptism in the holy spirit if you go back to matthew chapter 3 even there uh, John the Baptist seems to know about this promise where he says, oh, look at this, you know, behold the Lamb of God. This is Jesus. I baptize you with water, but, uh, you know, he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. So even John the Baptist knew about it. We know about the prophecy of Joel with the children of Israel would have been aware about. And, and Jesus is actually talking about that. And he's calling it the promise of the father he's saying the holy spirit will come you will be baptized in the holy spirit so it's really beautiful because just in these verses okay uh, uh verse four verse five you see the trinity why because and being assembled together with them he commanded he is who the lord jesus he talks about the promise of the father so the son, the father, and then later on, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So we can find all three personalities in just these two verses okay? and how beautifully they work together. So the promise of the father, when we use the term promise, what do we expect? There has got to be a fulfillment. There is a promise. But there has got to be a fulfillment. So that was the special command of Jesus to the disciples. Look, something beautiful is going to happen. The promise that people waited upon all along is going to be fulfilled. The Holy Spirit will come and he will baptize you. So this is what he says. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Meaning, Jesus had already talked about this to the disciples. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay. Uh, also, uh, let, let us uh, re recall that Jesus is talking to people who have already received the Holy Spirit as believers. If you go back to John chapter 20, you will see you know uh, 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 over there you will see that uh, jesus is resurrected and he's ministering to the disciples so at one point he breathes upon the disciples what is breathing upon it, it is the release of the holy spirit upon the disciples so we as believers when we believe in jesus christ what happens the holy spirit comes to dwell within us at that point itself so were the disciples born again? Yes, we can say that they were born again because of the breathing of Jesus upon them. And the Holy Spirit already went and began to dwell in them. So now, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is talking about a different experience. They're already believers. They're already born again, the disciples. But he's saying, I want you to get something more. What is that? He says, baptism, baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now so baptize we uh, talked about this in other courses you know bap baptizo when we look at that greek word it's uh, the term immersion so the way john baptized how did john baptize john baptized people of unto repentance in water so they were completely immersed in water and they came out of the water signifying now uh, their their new journey with the lord their uh, renewed heart now in the same manner jesus is saying there's a separate experience of being baptized in the holy spirit or being immersed in the holy spirit which i want you all to have so don't leave jerusalem wait for the promise of the father very exciting Wait for the promise of the Father. John told, uh, baptized with water, but now you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And Jesus also reminds them, I've already spoken about this to you, and I really want you to get it. And uh, over here, another reminder for us is that at this time, when uh, you know the disciples had 
not yet received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Only once you see Jesus telling them, wait. Okay. Uh, nowhere else, as we continue to read the book of Acts, you will notice nowhere else will you find the apostles or the believers telling other believers you have to wait you know, for five days or ten days or something like that to receive the Holy Spirit. There's no waiting component later on. Uh, in fact, in some instances, it's, it's like they go, they lay hands, they pray, and people are baptized. So they never tell people to wait for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That waiting is only in this first chapter where Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem because it was going to happen in Jerusalem. Okay, So let's clarify that because uh, there are teachings where people tell people you have uh, uh, like, you know, teachers of the word tell uh, believers you have to wait. You have to wait you know, for many days or uh, just wait upon the Lord and you will get the. Uh, you actually don't need to wait. Uh, that was an instruction given to the disciples by the resurrected Christ. Okay, let's move on. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to just stop me and ask me. Okay, uh, so we will try to delve deep into. Uh, the truth that we can get from what we are reading. So verse 6 here says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay. Uh, so, you know, the disciples are just being themselves. They know these are special moments. They know that uh, Jesus is instructing them like this because he will go away and uh, he won't be with them. No, any longer and they're asking irrelevant questions <laughs> they're so excited they're like we need to find out uh, from jesus about you know these crucial things why did he come he came to die for the sins of the world we saw him dying so looks like the restoration of israel is going to take place so notice how they are disconnected to what God wants to unfold, the way God wants to do things. Their questions are not even connecting to what God is wanting to do at that point in time. So they ask a disconnected question. They say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Uh, now, the promise was there in scripture that uh, Israel would be restored. So it's nothing, nothing uh, out of, you know, out, out of... Uh, what Jesus had spoken that they were asking him, but the timing was not correct. So they could have asked him many other questions, but uh, at this point, they ended up asking him about the uh, restoration of Israel, but that was not the immediate plan of God. So how did Jesus respond to their query? Verse 7, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. So he's saying, valid question, but you know what? Just leave it to God regarding these times and seasons. You don't have to focus on this particular matter. He brings back their focus. He says, you know what? I will tell you what is important for you. Comes back to the point of the Holy Spirit. So just think about this as believers. The Holy Spirit is so important for us. That is what Jesus talked about repeatedly. He said, uh, you know, uh, wait, don't miss it. Uh, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've already told you about it. And again, he's saying, don't ask those questions because the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon you. That is what you should be focusing on. He, uh, he comes back to the Holy Spirit, verse 8. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is reminding the disciples, you need a different focus. And that focus should be the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And he's explaining it to them. He's saying the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Remember, I said that they were already born again. So a born again believer, do they have the Holy Spirit in them? Yes, 
every born again believer we already have the holy spirit in us and the holy spirit does his work of leading us of uh, you know reminding us of jesus uh, uh, giving us the conviction about you know, sin righteousness and judgment so he continues to do his work but there is another special experience with the holy spirit that jesus is explaining as when the holy spirit has come upon you okay the holy spirit coming upon the believers is the baptism in the holy spirit so holy spirit is already inside but another experience of the holy spirit coming upon us is also crucial for the believer what will happen to the believer when they are baptized in the holy spirit he says you shall be witnesses to me are these people not witnesses right now they continue to follow jesus isn't it um yes uh, we we know that the disciples were were distracted when jesus uh, went through his trial you know peter denied christ and they were not you know they they were not uh, uh, if you want to say like the best disciples that uh, jesus could have expected uh, yet they were witnesses for jesus yet they were known as the disciples of jesus uh, people associated them with jesus christ but now jesus is talking about another level of witness you shall be my witnesses you shall be witnesses to me when you look at the word witness there you know, the greek word is martus okay out of which we get the word martyr so it's almost like jesus is saying the kind of witness that you are going to be when you receive the baptism in the holy spirit is you know you, you will be like sold out not that all of us are going to be martyred that's not the point but it's that commitment that level of um, you know commitment to jesus the level uh, of the work of god in our lives and our love for god which will be birthed in our hearts it's going to be at another level so you shall be my witnesses in jerusalem judea samaria and to the end of the earth so he said you are going to be a special witness for me greatly committed to me you will see the power of god being demonstrated through your life uh, and everybody is going to know about it so how does he tell the disciples that everyone is going to know about it by saying you will be my witness here and everywhere so he is using that progressive way of speaking you know, geographically we know jerusalem judea samaria and to the end of the earth so everyone will know that you belong to me and you are my witness but for you to be such a powerful witness you need the baptism in the holy spirit uh, and that is the reminder of the lord jesus so notice two things that jesus laid emphasis on and that uh, luke is pointing us to he's saying he talked about the things pertaining to the kingdom of god and then he speaks about the baptism in the holy spirit because as uh, believers the disciples needed it as believers we needed and uh, these are the two themes that jesus had uh, spoke of before he ascended now going to verse 9 here says now when he had spoken these things while they watched he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel who also said men of galilee why do you stand gazing up into heaven this same jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven <clears throat> now people have a question what was the need for luke to say that they watched him and he was taken up into heaven he could have just said jesus ascended and left it there but there are explanations to why luke may have said things like this uh, so you know some some uh, commentaries say that um, after jesus resurrected people were talking you know 
they were kind of um, making their own stories about Jesus. And once Jesus ascended, there could have been so many stories without sufficient proof, isn't it? So Luke is making it very clear. He's saying, look, Jesus didn't uh, escape to another nation or escape to another region. Let's make it very clear. All the disciples witnessed while they watched. He was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he makes it very clear. Where did Jesus go? He ascended up into heaven. Okay? And a cloud received him. Now, when we talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus, we sing that he's coming on the clouds. He's coming back on the clouds. So it's, it's like saying he went into heaven and he come back from heaven to receive us. And Luke is making that very, very clear. He's also saying they look steadfastly toward heaven, meaning let's not have any confusion about this. They were watching as he was taken up. Okay, And that is the real story here, that Jesus ascended up into heaven uh, as he went up. And they were just watching the Lord Jesus. Now we can imagine the emotions that the disciples could have been through. Oh, Jesus, you were with us. It was so good. Uh, you know, bread was multiplied. Wine was, you know, water turned into wine. Life was so beautiful uh, with you, Jesus. And unfortunately, they saw the trial of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. And they, they must have been in anguish and grief at that point. But wow, once again, God does this, uh, this wonder of resurrecting the Lord Jesus. And Jesus is back with them. Uh, the disciples would not have wanted to leave Jesus, right? If they had an opportunity, they would have held on to Jesus and said, don't go anywhere. We want you right here, okay? But in front of their eyes, he's ascending up into heaven. So when Luke is selling, they look steadfastly toward heaven. We can only imagine all the emotions that went through them and they're thinking, why is this happening? We want you back. You know, Jesus, uh, uh, what are we going to do? Maybe some of them would have been worried. How is life going to be? How will we be his witnesses? What is it that we have to do? But many questions and, uh, you know, grief. And uh, I don't know if joy would have been a part of this list, but they were lost. They were only looking at Jesus. And they were thinking, what do we do now? They looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up. You see, when we are in positions where we are wondering, Lord, what do we do now? How do we, how do we go about our lives now? God is faithful to give us the essentials or you know the keys, whatever we need at that point. He already told them, look, you know what you need? We need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Get it, okay? Don't forget it, get it. You need to be grounded in the truth of the kingdom of God. Be focused on that. Now, he's sending a reminder in the form of two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, the, ex the explanation about these men seems like they could have been angels. So when we need an angel or when we need, uh, you know, God to speak in a certain way to guide us, God is so faithful, he does it. So there were two men in white apparel, most likely angels, uh, who stood by them and they told them, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Or in other words, they're saying, don't worry, this is not the end of the story. There is so much more to come. There's so, uh, you know, uh, like uh, an exciting life ahead of you. Why are you standing, gazing up into heaven as if everything is over? It's not over yet. And they are reminding the disciples, you know, this Jesus whom you saw being taken up in the cloud, this same Jesus, okay? They are also clarifying to the believers, he's going to come back. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come 
in like manner as you saw him go into heaven and we know paul talks about this he talks about this he talks about you know the resurrection of the believer uh, in the book of corinthians he talks about the second coming of christ in uh, uh, to the thessalonians so he says we are people of hope uh, we will be resurrected you know so if we uh, are die in christ we will be resurrected and the same jesus will come back to receive us so uh, these angels are giving them a message of hope and they're saying that Jesus will come back in the same way to receive you. But what is the other message that comes through to us over here? Basically, what God is telling the disciples is, come on, you know, get up. You got work to do. You can't, you can't just sit and gaze and wonder, oh, it was so good when Jesus was there. It was so nice sitting and listening to sermons. It was so good being in church. Yeah, good. You know, we've listened. We've received what we need to receive. Uh, and whatever God wanted to impart it to us, we've taken it. But there's work for us to do now. So it's like God telling them, come on, now it's your turn. You've got to go. You've got to do a work. And I'm getting you ready for it. I'm going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit, your disciples. And you will do that work. So. That's why we say the acts, right? So we earlier we said the acts of the Holy Spirit through God's people, but the acts of the apostles is, you know, uh, what what this book is titled. The acts that the apostles did by the power of the Holy Spirit. So till now it was about what Jesus taught, what Jesus did. Now it's going to be about what the disciples the apostles are doing but who is who is the one empowering them to do all these things the holy spirit but there is a work for every disciple to do and that was the reminder from these angels and they said come on uh, stop gazing at heaven now you get up you need to go you need to get a work done okay now let's uh, uh, come to verse 12 here uh, let me quickly pause uh, just to see if there's you know anything that we want to talk about so yeah oh okay uh, jeffina is asking a question here but is there any reason why jerusalem judea and samaria were mentioned uh i can only tell you what i think uh jerusalem judea and samaria so those were the regions where ministry would happen through the apostles and god knew that right primarily those are the regions uh, and then paul and his team would go a little further so though it says the end of the earth europe asia minor only that much they could cover in their lifetime okay so god was just saying what is going to happen but it is also um like pictorial language where God is saying that the place where you are and the place a little farther away from you and the farthest places you will impact. So it's literal and pictorial. Yeah, thanks, Jatina, for that question. Anything else? Uh, what are you all thinking as we're talking about uh, Acts? Are you feeling excited? Is that a no? I can't hear any one of you saying anything or commenting. OK, only Subhashish is excited. I'm happy. I feel encouraged. OK, Jafina is also excited. That's great. OK, everyone, uh, uh, you know, this this is an exciting uh, uh, book of the Bible where, yeah, thank you, Lyndon, uh, where we are seeing how God started to work, you know, through his people. So right now, uh, we've, we've seen the ascension of Jesus, and we've also seen the encouragement or the redirecting of God to the focus that the disciples need to have. So he was telling them, I know you have all these other questions, but you should have the focus 
on uh, doing what I'm calling you to do, and I'm empowering you by the Holy Spirit. Let's go on to verse 12. There, uh, it says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is uh, near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So they come from, they come to Jerusalem, because that was the instruction of Jesus, right? He commanded them, you stay in Jerusalem. So what have they done? Obedience. They obey Jesus. He told us to be there, we will be there. They go to Jerusalem. And it talks about you know, how long the journey was. Uh, and when they had entered, they went up into the upper room. What is this upper room? It is said that the upper room is a, um, you know, a, a place uh, near the temple. It was a place near the uh, temple. Now we we are aware that the festival of Pentecost is around the corner, and that's the time when people Jews from many parts uh, of the region would come to celebrate the Pentecost in Jerusalem. So, uh, you know, places would, would be um, uh, offered, rented out and all of that. And so it was a common practice. They could actually come and they could get a place for themselves and uh, be there. So upper room is one of those spaces where uh, the disciples chose to stay. So they went to the upper room or this, this particular uh, place where they were staying. Now, who were all part of uh, uh, that that group in the upper room? They listed out Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, uh, Judas, the son of James. Okay, notice 11 disciples have been mentioned. But isn't it supposed to be 12? What happened? Huh? Okay, so Javina is saying later on we'll, we'll see Matthias joining. No, yeah, but who is supposed to be in this group? Judas is carrying, correct, correct. Yeah, Rosalind, Judas is carrying, so he is the uh, person who's missing yeah. right now, and that's why. You know, uh, I, I said only 11 are here. But what is the beauty about these people? So they all continued with one accord. Right? Uh, and further, it says, in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So uh, Judas Iscariot backslided. Okay? He went away from Jesus. But these 11 uh, disciples, what is their story? They continued with Jesus. And that's a beautiful reminder for us. Yes, when we begin our journey with uh, Jesus, it's it, it's wonderful. Uh, and all these dreams are in our hearts. And you know we have a vision and we have passion. Uh, but keeping that passion alive, journeying with God till the end, that is required of us. And we are being reminded through the lives of the disciples that here are 11 men who continued. They continued. And then in this uh, specific situation, they continued in one accord, it says, meaning one heart. What is one accord? One accord is having unity of heart. Now, physically, we can be together. But uh, we all know that even if, let's say, three people are uh, in a home and they are physically together, they can be so different in their thinking and their values and you know what their purpose is and, and there can be a lot of uh, um, uh, you know uh, how do you say strain in in uh, the relationship of these three people but here you find that these 11 men are continuing in one accord meaning they are together in heart regarding the purpose of god and at this point what is it that they are believing god for together they are believing god for the promise of the father jesus said not many days from now you will receive it so they believe that and they are together and they're all trusting god yes it's gonna happen you know we will pray uh, it says prayer and supplication so that again is wonderful knowing that the disciples knew what to do. 
with what Jesus had spoken. Jesus said all these things. Now, what do they? What is the first thing they are doing about what they have learned? They are praying. They they are speaking to God earnestly, supplication, and they're saying, "Lord, you said all these things. Please do it in our lives." So, prayer, a life of prayer in unity with one another. They they are uh, you know seeking the Lord. So that attitude of seeking the Lord is part of the disciples. Okay, and that's really beautiful to see uh, how they are living for God. And uh, they were not alone because we see that uh, there were women with the disciples. So uh, obviously the ministry of Jesus, uh, it impacted many lives. There were 12 disciples of Jesus, but there were many other followers. They, they were uh, 12 apostles, but then there were many other disciples of Jesus. So obviously these women also were uh, followers of the teachings of Jesus, and that is why they were also there waiting for the promise of the Father. Uh, you see that Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was also a disciple of the Lord Jesus. This is something for us to note. Uh, as the mother of Jesus, she could have been uh, like, okay, whatever God wanted to accomplish through my life, I've done it, it's over, now let me just live my life. However, to Mary, was she also continued. She knew who this Jesus was, the Son of God himself. And so she's looking at him in that light, isn't it? Not just as a son, but uh, she is giving him the honor of the Son of God. So Mary is also part of that group. And with his brothers, uh, now that is uh, really beautiful. I don't want to get into the details of that, but we know there are passages that say that uh, the brothers of Jesus did not give him honor as the son of God. They treated him just as an ordinary person. All right. Uh, but at this point, we notice that uh, we notice that even the brothers of Jesus have put their trust in him. So uh, James, Jude. These are all the brothers of Jesus, and they have become the disciples of the Lord Jesus, and that is exciting news for us. So how did they become disciples? You see, some people point to the resurrection, that the resurrection was uh, such an event that it jolted people out of their unbelief to know that, oh, this person, Jesus, no, the carpenter's son, uh, we know him, we know his family, but it's when he died and he rose again that especially the family of Jesus realized, oh, it was not an ordinary human being, but it was the Lord himself who came and lived uh, among us. So even the brothers of Jesus put his trust in Jesus. So it's so beautiful that you have the apostles, you have other disciples, you have some uh, you know, women, you also have the family of Jesus who are there in the upper room. What are they doing? They are waiting for the promise of the Father. How are they waiting? They're waiting in prayer and supplication. And it says, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Now, nothing new about Peter. Huh? He loved to talk. He loved to be the first one, you know, uh, and uh, in some commentaries we read uh, about Peter and his personality. It is said that uh, he spoke before he thought. I don't know. I hope Peter's not angry with me for saying all these things. But, you know, some people evaluate him like that. He spoke before he understood what he was saying. Um, and uh, at, at times when he, uh, he needed to step up. You know, at the trial of Jesus, uh, he wasn't covetous. Like he, he didn't show up. He denied Christ. He fled the scene. And that's really sad. Even at this point, you know, the disciples are in a crucial time. Uh, and uh, something has changed in the life of Peter. Yes, like he always does, he speaks. But you notice that he's taking leadership. Okay, oh, he's taking his position of leadership. How did it happen? Well, it was uh, the way God has called 
you know, each of, of the disciples, the way God has called each of us uh, and the grace which was upon Peter's life. Nobody had to tell him, Peter, this is the time you need to address the uh, disciples because they may be in doubt, uh, uh, they may be in grief. Jesus has left us, he's ascended into heaven. Nobody had to tell him anything. But the grace of God which was upon his life, Peter stood up. He automatically took, took the position of a leader. And amazing to see that everyone else is following along. They're actually listening to him. So it was the way God worked. That was the time for Peter to take like the, you know, the uh, wheel in his hand and begin to direct the disciples on what needs to be done. So he stood up uh, amidst the disciples. And we are told that number of names was about 120. So when we imagine the upper room, oh, it must have been a big room because there are 120 people there. And uh, he said to them, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled. So now Peter is beginning to uh, lead the disciples. He's addressing them. And how, how is he uh, ministering to them? On the basis of scripture. Okay? So he feels like something important needs to be done right now on the basis of what scripture has spoken. So what is it that will be done now? He says, look, as per what scripture said, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So he's talking about Jesus. Uh, he's talking about Judas. Okay, and uh, what happened to Judas? The fact that he betrayed Jesus and then, you know, Judas uh, hung himself. Uh, he died uh, a very, uh, like a, a very uh, unfortunate uh, death, a very gory uh, scene that he paints out over here. He fell and he died and all of that. But he reminds the uh, disciples that according to the word of God, this has happened. So he quotes a, a passage here from Psalms. He says, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. So he's just reminding the people that all this has happened. Uh, but scriptures do mention that we have to position someone else in that place so that Judah, Judas left vacant. So Peter is taking responsibility to uh, bring in another leader into the fold of the apostles. Okay, so now uh, are there any questions? Are there any doubts about Judas? All right. Uh, I've been asked this question in the past uh, session, so that's why I, I just thought you two might be wondering. You know, uh, when uh, Peter says that the scriptures are telling us that somebody has to take his position, it almost feels like uh, the scriptures had predicted that Judas is going to do this and uh, that he will betray Jesus. So is it like uh, God... You know, people use the term allowed, God allowed, or God designed for Judas to sin against God, and then the position would be vacant, and, uh, you know, uh, Peter and all would have to go and do an election for the 12th person among, uh, in, in their group. So it's not like that. So we must understand that free will is something that is so important to God. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, God created man and woman, and he told them, you can have everything, but you know, don't eat of the certain tree. God never controlled them. He gave them the option. He gave them free choice and said, it's up to you. I'm telling you what needs to be done, but you make your choice. So uh, in the integrity of, of this thought, when we talk about the life of Judas, I'm sure you know, God would have 
uh, uh, spoken to his heart many times, and uh, he would have had the opportunity to make the right choice, but for whatever reason, he went ahead and made uh, the wrong choice. But uh, God knows the end from the beginning, isn't it? It's not that God is directing somebody's, God is controlling somebody's choice, but uh, God knew what Judas is going to choose. And thus, there is a mention in the book of Psalms that this place is empty. Let his, habit, uh, let his habitation be desolate or uh, uh, when, when one sins against God, you know, that, that dwelling place of that person is desolate uh, and let no one live in it, let another take his office. So it's pointing to Judas uh, in a manner that God in his foreknowledge was aware about what is going to take place. It's not so much that God controlled the life of Judas and you know Judas was made to sin to um, uh, have this story that we have today. Okay, so we must not look at it that way because uh, God is the initiator uh, of free will and choice. Uh, and so it was Judas's choice to betray Jesus and do all the things that he did. Very, very unfortunate to know that. So uh, we see that Peter was actually asking for the disciples to pick another person. So that's what happens from verse 21. Therefore, of uh, these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So he's wanting an apostle in the team. And uh, uh, again, we'll see how they chose. They are choosing a faithful person. Because what does he say? He says, among those who have been with us, who have uh, from the beginning baptism of John. So it's not like these people suddenly came into the picture. But those who have journeyed faithfully with Jesus and us, among them, let us pick someone. So they propose two names and they say, you know, Joseph uh, uh, called Barsabas and Matthias. Come on. Among these two, let us pick someone. Uh, and it's beautiful because even when they had to select uh, among two choices, it was not so much uh, a mental exercise, but it was a prayerful exercise. In verse 24, we read, and they prayed and said, they pray to God and they say, God, Reveal your purpose to us. You, O oh Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. He was numbered to be 11 apostles. So though it seems like only election, isn't it? You vote. Let's vote. Let's pick the right person. But it was a prayerful selection of the person according to the plan of God, according to the purpose of God. So this is uh, from Acts chapter 1, just uh, an introduction for us. But we will keep getting deeper uh, into what's happening uh, in, in the lives of these disciples. And I, I really look forward to seeing you in the next session, which is about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so uh, let's pray and close if there are questions. Please continue to post it on the stream page. Uh, I can address them over there. So request somebody to please pray. We we'll close. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time of class that we had. Lord, we thank you for taking up the cross. We thank you for resurrecting and ascending into heaven again so that we can have this great Holy Spirit, so that we can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so that we can uh, be filled with power, filled with your guidance, and do mighty things for you down here on this earth, Jesus. Your plans, your works are beyond imagination. Thank you for everything that you've said. And God, we bless this class as we listen to the next classes. Uh, help us to have a deeper re uh, re revelation of who you are and what you have did for us. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.
thank you, Zafina. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a good day. Uh, we'll meet again in the next class. Bye for now.